There's good and bad news in Coronation Street tonight at 7.30. And after that, John Thor stars as Inspector Morse at 8 o'clock. Now, this is Thames with This Is Your Life. This is your life, and on my right here, Rani the Elephant, and she and all these other marvellous circus acts are here to help me surprise a remarkable man whose life has been one long adventure. Now, for many decades, his was a household name for anyone who loved the circus. And he's coming here to this temporary Paolo circus tent in Teddington for what he thinks is a review of new circus talent. So, uh, Rani, I think it's time for us to move across and give him a jumbo surprise. You pretty little pachyderm. Apart from his uh, circus work, this man has had an extraordinary life, including top-secret espionage work during the war. But I've got a secret here tonight that he knows nothing about. I know that he's on his way now, so I'm going to leave you in the hands of a real circus ringmaster, Mr. Ken McManus. Now, take the music down, lads. We don't want to spoil the surprise. Gentlemen, we welcome to the ring one of the giants of the circus. And here is my deputy ringmaster to make a special announcement. I'm afraid we've got you here under false pretenses, sir, because uh, I'm here, in fact, to say Cyril Bertram Mills, past master of the circus tonight, this is your life. <laughs> You're pulling my leg. <laughs> Actually, not. We have lots of legs we'd like to pull. A bit later in the show, we're going to tell your amazing story back at our This Is Your Life studios. So if you would like to prepare yourself for that, I will remind our viewers with an old newsreel of the Bertram Mill Circus at its heyday what it was like. So roll up for the greatest show on earth. <laughs> We've just seen the greatest show on earth that you produced, Cyril, and here we've produced your family and some of your greatest friends on earth. Not forgetting, of course, the lady you met in Canada back in 1943 and married seven years later, your wife, Mimi. Oh, no. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right.
Mimi, what was it like for you in the days when uh, Cyril's life was taken up entirely with the circus? Well, it was a very happy life when he was at home, but it had its sad moments because he had to be away so often. So it was lonely too. I understand. Cyril Bertram Mills, this is your life. It starts for you at Edgware, Middlesex on February the 27th, 1902. Your late parents, Bertram and Ethel, send you to prep school at Elstree and then to Harrow. This leads to a friendship with a boy who used to clean your shoes in his role as the school fag. And I was lucky enough to follow in your shoes. You were together at Harrow 70 years ago, <laughs> Alan Hill. <laughs> Wonderful you were a very you. understanding person to work for, I remember that. Well, well tell, us, tell us all about it. Now, you, you followed in Cyril's shiny shoes then. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Yes, for shiny shoes. You became shoes. head of the school and all sorts of things like that. Oh, you were the house captain of football, weren't you? Yes, I think I managed that. Yeah. And as his fag, were you well treated? Very well treated indeed. Yeah. You see, I was excused all other fagging by being a personal fag of Cyril's. And that was very pleasant. I didn't have to come running when they gave a three-boy call. You know? <laughs> Sounds like a three-line whip. Thank you very much, Alan Hill. Pass along now. Now, Cyril, in 1920, you go up to Cambridge to read engineering. At university, your fellow students include chariots of fire Olympic heroes Harold Abrahams and the late Lord Burley, with whom you have a lifelong friendship. And here with us tonight, your old Cambridge chum, Sir Edward Thompson. It is a leisurely lifestyle, but your father is determined that you should have a career in business. At the end of one term, he sends you to Canada with just a few pounds in your pocket and a letter of introduction for a job in a real estate office. On your return to Cambridge, your father, a prosperous coach builder and importer of American automobiles, shocks the family by announcing that he is going to run a circus at Olympia. This is what the Bertram Mill Circus looked like in those early days when it quickly gained a reputation of being the best in Europe. <laughs> Edward Campbell, you're an authority of the history of the circus. Bertram Mills was not content to run any old show, was he? No, indeed he wasn't. I was book editor of the Evening News, and I was absolutely stuck for some phrase which would somehow be the essence of all I thought Cyril Mills had done. And it suddenly came to me. He was the man who put the circus in Debrett, and justifiably so, because the circus of Bertram and Cyril Mills was quite superb. He attracted quality and it became, instead of a vulgar entertainment for masses, it became a fine art. But the masses still enjoyed it, of course. <laughs> now, you travel the world for your father looking for the finest acts, but your earliest job with the circus is the menial task of bill posting to tell people the circus is in town. Meantime, you continue your studies at Cambridge and leave in 1923 with a degree in engineering. But you've been bitten by the circus bug. And when your father offers you an executive job in 1925, you snap it up. It's the start of a 40-year association with the business, during which you make Bertram Mills a household name by booking world-famous acts like these. We cross the Atlantic to what is known as Circus Town in Sarasota, Florida, where we're dropping in on its annual parade. Here, sir, are some faces that will be familiar to you, giants of the circus ring who often featured for you in the Bertram Mills Big Top. Barry Sloan and his wife Sheila, Billy Baker, Kenny Dodd, John Young, Emrich Moroskowski, Gaynor Moroskowski, Jermaine and Justino Loyal, Arthur Grotterfont, and the first lady of the circus from the most spectacular high wire act in the world, Helen Wallender. Hello, Sarah. It's such a privilege to work this circus. Once you work the Olympia and over there, you had it made. You go to Winter Garden and all the big dates, and that's what we did. 
and thanks to you. Also here, a good friend of yours and one of the circus's greatest superstars, Elvin Bale. Hi, Cyril. You recall that I was the human cannonball until I had an accident in Hong Kong which left me with a broken vertebrae. And you were there when I took my first steps and you encouraged me to keep going and to get back into show business. Well, Cyril, I'm trying and I must say that you're a legend in the circus world and we'll never forget you and we appreciate your kindness to all of us that have worked for you and our families that have worked for you. And I can only say to you, have a great night. Thank you, Elvin Bale, and thank you, the Circus Folk of Sarasota. Well, Cyril, in 1933, you take over as producer and director of the Bertram Mills Circus with your late brother, Bernard, as manager. But as busy as you are, you still have an unquenchable thirst for adventure. You look around for your next thrill and decide on flying and buy yourself a second-hand gypsy moth for 250 pounds. You become known as the flying director as you pilot yourself around Europe in the search for new acts. Now, as war clouds gathered over Europe, your flying expertise came in handy far away from the world of the circus. Isn't that right, Christopher? Yes, as you travelled over Germany, you noticed that they were building airfields, military airfields, so you went and told your friends at British Intelligence and then later on, you went and flew over the Messerschmitt factory taking pictures for MI6. British intelligence realised your value and recruit you for crucial counter-espionage work. And here to take us into that shadowy spy-catcher world are two old colleagues of yours, former officers with MI5, Colonel Tar Robertson and Major Christopher Harmer. Can you beat it? I never thought they'd catch me like this. I never thought they'd catch me. We're renaming the program Spycatcher for you. So. <laughs> oh, Colonel, Colonel Robertson, what was Cyril's role as a case officer? Well, his job was to look after agents which had been sent to this country and uh, turn them around and play them back to the Germans. They were, in fact, double agents. And uh, Cyril was a marvellous operator. He was a pretty tough character in every possible way. And, but he was very kind to his agents. But he was named by us with no sort of uh, uh, ill feeling, the old dog. And doesn't he look like that? <laughs> <laughs> and he had under his control the best agent we ever had in Avery Garbo. And here you are, I believe, with uh, Garbo, that is his <laughs> code name, of course, <laughs> who uh, was probably the most successful of, as you said, of our double agents of the war. Now, Christopher, you've plucked one particular case from the files. Well, I think, Cyril, the best <laughs> thing you ever did was when you went down from Canada to help the FBI find that spy. You told them to identify every single um, newspaper kiosk and news agent in New York, which sold Brazilian papers, because you said sooner or later you'll feel homesick and come and buy a paper. And in a few days they got him. Now, isn't that right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, that's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> 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 Well, as well as tracking down spies, you made that personal catch in Canada. Mimi, how, how did you meet? We met socially while I was busy catching spies. Simple as that. <laughs> Simple as that. He fitted you in between spies. Yes, he did. <laughs> now, you finish your work as a security liaison officer in Canada in 1945, and you return to London to tackle the job of getting the Bertram Mills Circus back on the road and re-established at Olympia. In those immediate post-war years, it becomes the most popular circus attraction of all time. Her Majesty attended a special circus performance in aid of the London Federation of Boys Clubs. The famous clown, Percy Huckster, presented a bouquet. Variety Club of Great Britain arranged the show and presented were the club's international representative, C.J. Latter, and popular chief barker, Jimmy Carreras. Cyril and Bernard Mills escorted the royal party, which included Princess Margaret. But away from the public spotlight, you have to work extremely hard to keep the circus on the road. Now, Larry Turnbull, you were a foreman with the Bertram Mills Circus. You've known Cyril for more than 40 years. What sort of boss was he? He was a wonderful disciplinarian, very, very strict, 
a wonderful man to work for. I've lost count of the number of children that he's brought into the big top to see the show. I've lost count of the number of charities that is uh, benefited from his interest in children. He's a great man, and I wouldn't have swapped him for all the money in the world. <laughs> Thank you very much. One of the most important roles in the circus is, as I know well, ringmaster. And it was you who had the idea of putting him in a red jacket and tails, which is now, of course, traditional uniform for ringmasters the world over. And it was you who, 30 years ago, introduced these ringing tones. My lords, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Bertram Mill Circus and to the greatest show on earth. The voice of the ring at Blackpool Tower Circus, Norman Barrett. <laughs> Now, Norman, you spent an early part of your career with the Bertram Mill Circus, but you did more, of course, than just make announcements. You see, running a big circus like Mr. Cyril Ryan, it's about organisation. And he was a great organiser. He could get us all motivated. And even when the tent was blowing down in the middle of the night, he'd be up there knocking the stakes in. He's also done a lot for me. And uh, when Bertram Mill Circus closed, he uh, wrote a very nice letter to Bernard Crabtree on my behalf uh, to the Blackpool Tower Circus. And since then, I've been there for 24 years. Thanks to you. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Stokes. Thank, Thank you, Norman Barrett. It was a Boxing Day tradition for many years at the Bertram Mill Circus at Olympia to be featured on the old light programme in the days when the radio was called the wireless. This is what the nation used to tune into. He calls to his partner, Pierre, who takes the high perch, braces himself, Marie-Louise, hands him the takeoff trapeze because the the artist himself always launches it he's timing the throw down he goes up and back and forward and away and there it goes and he caught him beautifully well that uh, that commentator at the microphone of the Bertram Mill Circus one evening, uh, there was a moment of drama that left him lost for words. He is here now to tell us about it. It's Raymond Baxter, and with him, the man who was his co-commentator co on Circus Night. He's in town tonight, Brian Johnston. Like everyone else. <laughs> Raymond, that commentary must have made you rather nostalgic for yesterday's world. Oh, yes, and what a wonderful world it was. Uh, at that one particular occasion, you said, here's an act which you will like. It's got a motorcycle in it, mm -hmm. and it consisted of a chap going up in a steel ball. So he was riding a wall of death with a hole in the middle and about a 60-foot drop. And then he started to take his jacket off, and I saw to my horror this jacket get caught in the rear wheel of the motorcycle. And I think I had cued to Brian before the accident actually happened. Brian, what did you find to say? Well, nothing very much, but luckily Bernard was there and he had a very boring looking white horse. And I said, Bernard, come and tell me about this very interesting animal. And what's that? Is that its front leg? Yeah. Is that its back leg? We went round behind pretty quick with the other leg and this, and then looked at his teeth. And we occupied five minutes. It must have been the most boring broadcast ever made. <laughs> That's saying a lot. That's a wall of silence. Thank you, gentlemen, very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. More surprises. For the last two decades, Cyril, you've been corresponding on a regular basis with a college professor in the United States. You became pen pals after you'd read a review he's written on the circus. You've swapped hundreds of letters, but you've never met or even spoken to each other. But tonight, Cyril, we meet at long last. Yes, we've whisked him across the Atlantic, Professor Arthur Saxon. <laughs> Bless you. Well, we brought you together. What do you think? 
Well, I think he looks exactly as I pictured him, like the typical English aristocrat. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. You know, I've always thought, Cyril, and this opinion is shared by any number of people in the States, that the Cyril, or the Bertram Mills Circus, especially under your direction, was fully the equivalent, at least, of anything we had to offer in America. And when that circus was forced to close its doors in 1966, a shining beacon went out in the circus world. Thank you, Professor Sachs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. 40 years ago, Cyril, during one of your flying trips to Germany, you discover a boy juggler. He was launched by the Bertram Mill Circus and became a world star. And he's here tonight from his home in Berchtesgarten, Rudy Horn. Wonderful. I'm thrilled to be here. So, Rudy, that break that you got was your first Please outside that. Germany, wasn't it, that 40 years ago? Yes. I don't know if Mr. Cyril remembers when he came to Germany. You were in a, uh, an American service club. Oh, Working ah. on a dance floor. That way it was. <laughs> How I see it. <laughs> I remember that Mr. Cyril also came to a circus, the Circus Krone. And I did the cups and saucer routine on the floor. Yeah. Ten cups and saucers. And then you said to me, or to my father, if you couldn't do the trick on a unicycle, then I book you for Olympia. <laughs> and you did it. Yes. Well, earlier this evening, I must tell you, Rudy gave us a demonstration of his unique skill, but it was not cups he was juggling with this time, but balls. Well, you've always had a great love for circus animals and you went to great lengths to see to it that they were always properly treated. Someone who appreciated this was this magnificent horseman who first appeared at the Bertram Mill Circus at the age of 13 and developed into one of the world's greatest equestrians. He became head of the famous Knie Circus in Switzerland. Yes, it is Freddie Knie, and if you keep watching that screen, Cyril, you'll see him as he is today. <laughs> Hello, Cyril. Remember, I coming with my... The bits are horses in the ring from the Olympia London. Very important people. I come to see me. Yes, sir, your <laughs> 15 grandchildren. <laughs> well, he has bedded his horses to join you here from his home in Zurich, Freddy Knie. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you very much. We have another surprise for you, Cyril. From Florida, one of the legendary superstars of the circus, seen here in his daredevil days. He told us earlier how his dangerous act went wrong and he was badly injured and he has travelled from America to be here oh, with I you tonight, Elvin Bale. I can't believe it. Elvin, but all those grandchildren of yours as well. Hello, 
everyone. Hello, all of you. Cheryl Bertram Mills, Circus Master, this is your life. Oh. Thank you, Martha. Wait and see. But now in NICAM Stereo Surprises with This Is Your Life. This is your life, and I'm embracing Blackpool, not just to enjoy their famous illuminations, but to savour another time-honoured institution, the Tower Circus. Since the turn of the century, holidaymakers, most of them workers from the once thriving mill towns, have flocked here to enjoy the thrills and the laughter of the tower's sawdust ring. But this is the end of an era. When these lights are switched off, signifying the end of another holiday season, the circus lights will be switched off too. But this time, forever. Pitched here in the 1890s, the tower circus is finally leaving town. Millions of children have tingled with excitement at the very thought of going to this famous circus. And tonight there's a really spectacular finale, with, of course, a special extra item, the book, with which I shall surprise a man who's been very much part of the colourful circus scene for the past three decades. Hi, Michael. Hi. Hi. And my thanks to Peter and Christine Jay, producer and director of the show, for keeping Hi. our secret. We're just going up to the finale, so we're going to get in there quick. OK. OK. okay. I'll show you the way. Lead on. Congratulations, Norman. A wonderful show. <laughs> I walk the plank to say tonight, Norman Barrett, this is your <laughs> life. Yeah, he's had me going all day. <laughs> Thank you very much, Michael. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to do the show, as they say, right here in this ring yes. as soon as we've mopped up. Oh, so get your breath back and we'll do the show. Thank you very Thank much. you, ladies and gentlemen. Norman Barrett, this is your life. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
Come on, Norman, the show must go on. Yes. And already sitting quietly, obviously well trained, is your wife Sally, and the young man who works that fabulous water effect, your son Guy. And what a turnout of big top names. We have Austin, Rosaire, Club, Chipperfield, Cottle, Gandhi, Paulos. And sharing a bit of history here with you tonight, resident at the Tower for the last time, the Roberts Circus with one of its founding fathers, Bobby Roberts Sr. Well, Norman, the very first announcement in your life came on December the 20th, 1935, in the local newspaper under births. You're the only child of Wynne and George Barrett. Your father was a gentleman farmer of Oosburn near York. He had a passion for the circus and a natural knack for training animals, particularly horses and dogs. He started his own touring circus, every mile hauled by real horsepower. The ringmaster, who else but your father? That jacket would have burst with pride had he lived to see you as ringmaster to the greatest in 10 years of television's Circus World Championship. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your host for tonight, your ringmaster, Mr. Norman Barrett. Thank you very much indeed. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to a gala performance of the Circus World Championships. <laughs> That's great stuff. And you started riding lessons in armchair comfort. Your parents on tour, you're a boarder at Ripon Grammar School, but live for the holidays and circus life. Just 12, you dream of becoming a lion trainer. There's the little lad with the big cats. But Norman, I think your father offered you some advice in that department, didn't he? Yes, he said that uh, lion trainers got the most money, but ringmasters live the longest. <laughs> <laughs> Despite your father's own circus biting the sawdust in the mid-50s, the big top is still the life for you. You join another circus driving and servicing the heavy vehicles. And here you are, on a day off, enjoying a couple of beers, <laughs> both at the same time. You start to appear in the ring as a trainee clown. One night in Sunderland, just before the band strikes up, the course of your life changes. Norman, you're a bloody awful clown. Get that costume off and put this on. Wife of the owner of the Roberts Brothers Circus, Kitty Roberts. Right. So, Kitty, what you handed Norman was not a tutu, then? No, it wasn't a tutu. <laughs> no, no. It was a red ringmaster's jacket and trousers. And I oh. said to him, this is your first night at a being the ringmaster. There he is. And there That's he right. is. And you've gone from better, bigger, and you have proved to me that you have been the best and well-loved ringmaster in the country. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Kitty. Thank you. Thank you. Well, later, Norman, you formed a two-man juggling act with one of Kitty's sons. That's right. Remember, we was the Barrow Brothers. Yes. The other half of the Barrow Brothers, Bobby Roberts. Yes, Bobby. Bobby. <laughs> 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 I'm not going to use those things tonight, are we? We'll do it later. No, we'll no, do it now. 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 Yeah. We used to do it, remember?
1959 and the 24 year old Norman Barrett finds himself in the big top big time you're invited to join the world famous Bertram Mills Circus not as ringmaster but presenting an act called the courier you called on all the riding skills you've learned from your father and you determined to follow in the sawdust footsteps of one man in particular my lords ladies and gentlemen and that legendary opening announcement for the bertram mill circus comes from the man who took over the ringmaster's role from his famous father flown in from hamburg with his wife for a ghana frank foster <laughs> Now, Frank, you were ringmaster at that world-famous circus when Norman first arrived. That's right. Uh, I must say that Norman really picked it up very, very, very quickly. One other thing, Perestroika in our business has been there for hundreds of years. And when we are on the other side of the world, maybe at a party with international artists from China, Russia, and Norman's name comes up, it has always been Norman. What a good ringmaster. What a nice man. Diplomatic, friendly. You couldn't wish to meet a nicer man. And that oh, is true. <laughs> it's Fine true. <laughs> Thank you, Frank Foster. And we're done. Thanks, Frank. See you later. See you later. Thank you very much. Well, on with your story. You become equestrian director for Bertram Mills, but in 1964, the Mills Big Top was on the brink of folding, so you decided to train an act of your own. Now, Derek Burrell Davis, you produced those Olympia shows for television, and Norman invited you, I believe, to a sneak preview of his act. <laughs> yes, he, he telephoned me at um, Television Center, and with my assistant, Mary David, who's now my wife, we went down to Bertram Mills Winter Quarters at Ascot, and Norman met us. In his hand he held six whips, and on his face was a very serious expression. And I said, Norman, six whips? That's, that's going into bed, it's not like you. He said, they're very fresh today. And he led us right into the training area, and eventually we came to a door, and he opened the door, and as he opened the door, he said, down boys, back, down. And then he stepped aside, and we went into the room, and there in the middle on the table were 12 budgery guts. <laughs> Well, that is. <laughs> Your new act, Norman, and still very popular to this day. In fact, they've got a circus act of their own, so let us see the Savage Barrett <laughs> Budgies. Sit still. Hold tight, hold tight. Hold tight, everybody. Let's go. Are you ready, Cyril? Up. Find one, two. <laughs> No, well, you, uh, you joined Blackpool Tower Circus here in 1966. Yes. That year, you met and married ice skater Sally Glanville. I'm sure you recall that meeting, Norman? Yes, we were actually... Um, every Wednesday night, they used to have a, a night out at the um, casino club. We used to pay, I think it was ten and sixpence at that time, wasn't it? For chicken and chips and the cabaret. And I'd gone along with a friend of mine and said, well, save me a seat. He'd met a girl and completely forgotten about me wanting a seat. And the only seat in the whole of the club was next to Sally. The rest is history. The rest is history. Well, that pal who forgot to save a seat went to work and live in Sicily 15 years ago. Seems a bit drastic. And you haven't seen him since, but we saved him a seat tonight. Neville Denton. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Neville. Well, well, now, yeah. among the, uh, the close friendships you made in Blackpool was a man whose name was synonymous with the Tower Circus for more than 40 years. Here you are with the late Charlie Caroli. There you are. There you are. I've proved I'm not superstitious. You are a better man than I. Oh, I well. wouldn't do those things. Oh, no. There you are, Charlie. No one. No one. Yeah. Just one thing, though. What's that? Nothing's happened yet. 
But something could happen soon, so just yeah. be careful. Aha! Uh -huh. Right here, not superstitious. Nothing ever happens to you, touch Are you wood. Sure? Oh! Well, one of the great clowns in a tradition still flourishing, in fact, seen with you there, his son, Charlie Caroli, Jr. <laughs> Charlie, you were very much part of your father's act with uh, the ringmaster, weren't you? Yes. If the show wasn't going well or he wasn't in a good mood, because uh, I was a young apprentice then, he used to have to hit me. And if I ducked or anything like that, he used to hit me more. <laughs> and he's not very delicate, Norman, as you're going to find out in a minute. Oh, am I? Yes. Oh. We're going to give him a demonstration on how delicate you are. No, I used to say, don't worry, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> oh! <laughs> don't worry, you're all right. Don't worry, Will. And keep your head still oh. while I'm talking to oh. you, all right? <laughs> because that's enough. All right, bye. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Charlie Caroli, Jr. <laughs> Two years ago, Norman, you were involved in a life-or-death drama in this very ring. A lion trainer was in the cage with eight male lions. Suddenly, one of them leapt on him and pulled him down by the neck. Thanks to your lightning action, he lived to tell the tale. He talks to you now from Salt Lake City, Utah, where he's back among the big cats with the Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey. Luis Palaccio. Hi. Hello, Norman. I'm so glad to be part of This Is Your Life, because if it wasn't for you, mate, I would have lost my life. I remember when that big cat pounced on me, you came very bravely into the cage and fought him off me, while the two ring boys pulled me out. Thanks, Norman. Thank you, Luis Palacio in Salt Lake City. I think you're safer with the budgies, though, and it's with that cabaret act more than 20 years ago, you meet up with another entertainer you've worked with in Panto. Lonely as a desert breeze, get that breeze between your knees, all the world forgotten, oh, when I see you smile. Yes, from the desert song, the Red Shadow himself, <laughs> Bernie Clifton. Norman, Norman, I'm so excited. Michael. Yes, Michael. Yes, Norman, we first worked together over 20 years ago, <laughs> and I worked with him recently, and I must tell you, Norman, this is a very emotional moment for all of us. Yes, I'm on the verge of tears myself. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you know our idea. Yes, we're all actually on the verge of tears. <laughs> Today, Norman, after all those years, to me and to the rest of the business, ladies and gentlemen, Norman, you're still a breath of fresh air. <laughs> well, where were we? Um, Working here in Blackpool for the past 25 <laughs> years, you have struck up friendships with some of the great names in variety, including the star who's been packing them in at the London Palladium, Ken Dodd. Hello, young man. By Jove, how tickled I am, how full of plumpsiousness I feel to be part of the Norman Barrett Appreciation Society and Celebration Society here tonight. Norman, it gives me a great feeling of discomnocuration. I feel touchy hilarious to raise a glass to you on this wonderful night. Norman Barrett, Britain's greatest circus showman. Quite a good variety act, too, when you've got Freddie Halfpenny to help you. <laughs> a smushing bloke and a very, very, very nice man. A loyal friend and a very, very, very nice man. On this great evening, may we send lots of love from the Palladium to Sally, to the great magician Guy, and especially yourself. Norman Barrett, you're the king pole of the circus. <laughs> Long may you and circus entertain us. <laughs> Thank you, Ken Dodd. <laughs> uh, 
And uh, keep your eyes on the screen, Norman, as we bring your story bang up to date by going to Los Angeles. You've been advisor on his recent television shows in England. Uh, talking to you now, Scorch permitting, Ron Lucas. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood. Congratulations, Norman. Your life really has been a circus. Norman Barrett, at the risk of sounding cliché, you are the nicest, most caring person we have ever had the pleasure of working with. You care about folks on both sides of the footlight. This, excuse me, yeah. yeah. Um, you have a feather hanging off of your tooth? I do. What is that? Budgie. Budgie? <laughs> uh, they're very nice. Thanks to Ron Lucas and Scorch. Well, 40 years in the circus, Norman, you've seen and worked with hundreds of performers from all over the world. Once asked for your all-time favorite, you named this balancing act the Yong Brothers. Nearly 10 years ago, they quit the ring and went their separate ways. Tonight, they've flown in to get their act together again just for you.